Now uh, we can choose an orthonormal frame, partition frames in Minkowski space time. Partition frames. Okay, this is uh, a short introduction in the Minkowski space. So, a Minkowski space is characterized by events, space of events by a translation, by a vector space, and by a metric. And it's a, a flat affine space, and the metric is in, uh, given here in Cartesian coordinates. Okay. So, questions? So, um, this is Minkowski space. Now, uh, of course, uh, the important concept now in a, in a space is uh, the group of motions. In Minkowski space, the group of motions is called uh, Poincaré group. So in section one, two is Poincaré group. Poincaré. Oh, Poincaré, French mathematician. And the Poincaré group we can denote by T13 because of the signature, and it's defined as a semi-direct product. P13 is the semi-product, semi-direct product of translations, and these translations for apparently in four dimensions, um, multiplied semi-directly multiplied with the Lorentz group S013. Um, this one three uh, for students is my metric. Here we have here plus sign and here three minus signs. So that's the signature which is uh, 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 meant by this one three. And the translations are four-dimensional. And uh, this is the orthogonal group in four dimensions, but the signature one three and is special. Uh, so it's uh, the determinant is one. Uh, and this is the Poincaré group. Uh, well, uh, one could uh, give a whole lecture about the Poincaré group, which I won't do. Uh, there is an excellent book by by V W K Tung, which I like particularly. It's called Group Theory for Physics History, a uh, similar group. Theory for Physicists. And it's World Scientific, uh, 85, I believe. <coughs> World Scientific, 1985. <coughs> and so, uh, what I would like to do, because that's uh, good for understanding the structure, is to write down the Poincaré algebra. So I have um, generators of translations, four translations, and the generators are called PI. I runs from uh, 0 to 3, and 6 generators for Lorentz transformations. So 3 are boosts, don't be velocity, and 3 are spatial uh, uh, rotations. So altogether 6, 6, and this is, uh, we call these generators J, I, J. If you want to play with these generators then to verify the commutation relations which I'm going to give, then you can sort of represent such a, a, a translation by a gradient and such a rotation by x. 
the I times the, the translation, the partial J minus X J partial I. <coughs> if you uh, play with that, then you can easily recover the Poincare algebra P I comma the commutator with P J translations commute. They are abelian, an abelian subgroup of the Poincare group. But uh, this is the semi direct structure that translations do not commute uh, with the rotations, with the Lorentz rotations. So if I write here P I, uh, J, J, K, and J is anti symmetric, which you can see here, which I make it explicit in this clear since it's six and I have a matrix, it must be, so it's anti symmetric in these two indices. And of course, it doesn't vanish the commutation. If you first make a translation and then a rotation, something different will appear as if you make first the translation and then the rotation. This is we are from everyday life, but if you, uh, for instance, with this, you can play with it and derive. So it's, it's another way to say that uh, um, uh, translations transform the world transformations non trivially. So what you find is GIJ times PK minus GIK PJ. This is the semi-direct product. Uh, translations and rotations are not independent from each other. They are meshed, they are linked together in a, in a very intricate way. And this is the reason for the existence of orbital angular momentum. If this semi-direct structure wouldn't appear, you, you wouldn't have orbital angular momentum, you would only have spin and energy momentum. And the link between both motions is, is is, is this uh, commutation relation, which is very important in physics, uh, this structure. And this structure we will also see later if we uh, discuss curvature and torsion, we will see exactly the same structure that uh, the curvature uh, is like here now, the commutate of the j's, j i j, j too many j's, uh, k l equal well, I could write down easily or copy all pieces, but I think it's not necessary. The two rotations will always give a new rotation, and uh, you have here four terms uh, which have to respect the anti symmetry in these two indices. Uh, so, this is a Poincare algebra. And now it's very important in order to find physical interpretations, etc that you, you turn to the so-called Casimir operators, the quadratic Casimir operators. A Casimir operator is by definition an operator which commutes with all these uh, 10, we have here, okay, so 10 generators, so the the Poincare the group is 10 dimensional, 10 dimensional group, which of course you know already from classical mechanics that you have uh, uh, a 10 conservation laws in classical mechanics, energy, momentum is, is 1 plus 3 is 4, then you have uh, uh, angular momentum is 3, and then you have the theorem uh, for the constant motion of the uh, center of mass, which is uh, 3 more. So you have also in classical mechanics uh, 10 uh, uh, conservation laws, and this is reflected also in special relativistic mechanics. Okay, so the Casimirs, Casimir is the Dutch physicist, Casimir, who is, for instance, known, uh, I mean, what he did in his thesis was to uh, uh, study a rotating top. And in this context, he studied rotation groups and came to these operators as a physicist, as not a mathematician. He was later a, a director of the research of Philips, of the uh, Philips company, which uh, some of you may know built electronic equipment and stuff. When he was uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the research, the director of research, it was a very successful uh, company. So he, he was a theoretician at the same time, very practically oriented. So the first Parsimir, 
C1 is by definition, which you can also with the help of these uh, rules verify, PI times PI. And the second Casimir, well, say P, we say W, WI, WI, summation over I is understood. Now I have that just to tell you what is W. W is the so-called pauli lubanski vector. Pauli should be a household name for any physicist. Lubanski, but the Polish uh, physicist. Pauli lubanski vector. <coughs> And, and it's basically a sort of an angular momentum. It's Wi is equal, that's conventional, minus one half times the Levi Civita symbol, I J K L times I uh, J J K times P L. So it's sort of an exterior product in four dimensions of the translation uh, the translations and the rotations, the exterior product. And if you follow it up, then the orbital part of J drops out according to this definition and only the spin part is left. So if you look, what you should do if you run, if such operators act on states in quantum theory, is that a question? Okay. Um, um, uh, then, um, um, yes, what did I want to say? So if you look, as you should do, if you are in, probably have to be careful, that's a one, and that's an I. And this dot belongs to this definition side. If you look for the eigenvalues of these operators, then the C1 leads to mass square, and the C2, which is very global now, leads to m square times s times s plus 1, where s is the spin. So the, the second Casimir leads to spin, the first to mass of the square of the so this Poincaré algebra immediately tells us that mass and spin are the important quantities for characterizing matter. And this is deeply ingrained into space-time uh, uh, physics, into the uh, structure of a Minkowski space. We don't need much more than the Minkowski space and some um, uh, elementary um, um, knowledge of, of quantum theory that you can act with operators and states. Um, in order to understand that. So these are, uh, and the mass spin classification, now you have also to discuss some picture cases, like if the mass is zero, etc., which I will able to do now. The photon, for instance, the photon has then no spin anymore, but helicity, only two helicity states. Each massless particle has only two helicity states. Is it, uh, um, Photon or the graviton, all have two helicity set and you, you know yeah, if, uh, if one is not the only particle of the other. Um, so um, this is a universal classification which is valid uh, over whole, uh, the whole of physics <coughs> and of very fundamental importance. This was discovered and discussed in detail by me. He wrote a paper in 19, he emigrated at this time from Germany to the US, and he was at this time, I think in Bethlehem, <coughs> or in the Midwest somewhere, and then published this paper, which uh, first was not uh, noted uh, very much, but then later people discovered how important. It's called the uh, uh, representation of the inhomogeneous Lorenz group. It was incidentally Wittner who later suggested the name Poincaré group for, for the Poincaré group. And so I'm following Wittner's suggestions as most elementary particle physicists do, but not the sort of informal relativists. They call it in homogeneous moments. Okay, now we have a sort of the particle aspect 
Now we want to change, uh, well, I mean, we, we know we have particles in the world, but we have also fields, and we Sorry. are better educated. We have uh, 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 relative between both, yes? Uh, about C2, um, yes. by dimensionality counting, we still uh, need another, uh, like, four dimensionality. If I use, uh, Sorry? Uh, by dimensional counting, uh, C2 still needs um, extra uh, energy or mass dimension. What are they? Uh, it, it needs some additional dimensionality. Dimensionality. Yes. What? What? What are the others for? Well, um, I don't know. If I write down the formula, I also I don't need any uh, dimensions to introduce because it fits together. You know. I, I cannot answer this question really. I don't think. I mean, Mars has a different dimension than spin. We agree on that, you know. But I haven't thought now. Uh, exactly about these dimensions in this context. So, so if you use H5 or H1, then the angular momentum has uh, the H5 unit, so yes. which, is, which is one, and then there's, there's two are consistent. But of course, if you use spin, but, uh, uh, using angular momentum, H5 for spin, then uh, the spin carry H5. Yes, okay. Oh, but this is oh, classical theory, right? Pardon? But this is classical theory. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah but uh, no, you see, you can say you can tell and say yes, yes, it is dimensionless. So it doesn't say S is dimensionless. It is so equal, it just said sort of proportional. Yeah. 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 I mean, certainly uh, one should induce, uh, introduce carefully the dimensions. I totally agree, and I was careless in this connection. And uh, H bar would heal it, you know. This is clear. I mean, please uh, uh, look it up in, in the book of uh, um, Tum. Tum. There it's, it's done uh, in all details. Yeah. Okay, I guess. Okay, the symbol. Uh, uh, my question is, is S quantized or not? Um, it's quantized, yes. yes. But the usual, uh, you know, I mean, spin is, is quantized in nature, you know that. Still, I mean, there, there is something like macroscopic spin, you know? If you have, for instance, uh, uh, I mean, they even have uh, built nuclear spins, you can feel, build with nuclear spins uh, inertial platforms and uh, recess them and so on. And, and uh, for instance, if you have the einstein de Haas experiment, 1915, einstein de Haas experiment, you know you have a, ma a, a, a magnet, uh, um, and, and it's magnetized in one direction, and then uh, um, you, you flip the magnetization, then this bar will start to rotate. And we know that the ma magnetization, uh, ferromagnet, I should have said, the ferromagnetism is, is caused by the spin of electrons. It's not a, some classical motion or something. So, but, but a macroscopic piece of a ferromagnet has an average, a classical average of a spin density, and you can compute it, and in the einstein Haas, uh, the Haas experiment, you can check it. So certainly uh, everything in, uh, in, in nature, the spin is quantized, we know that, but still there are uh, situations where, where spin, where we can have macroscopic spin. Usually these are exotic situations because spin average out and so you don't see the spin on the macroscopic level because it's a dipolar type of quantity whereas a mass is isotropic and adds up for that reason you usually don't see a spin but this doesn't mean that it doesn't exist I mean you can have macros for instance in superconductors you can you can find uh, spin fluids in, uh, um, in a superconducting 
Kapitel 2 in der A-Phase. I think it's the A phase. Uh, you have uh, for the super for, uh, causing super uh, the superconductivity are two parallel spins, and one can describe it by a spin fluid, and it has a spin fluid tensor, a macroscopic spin fluid tensor, and these fluids you can measure. I mean, it's uh, like well, like a fluid in macrophysics. So even though it, uh, spin certainly is a quantum theoretical quantity, which is and, and usually macroscopically cannot be seen in special situations, and this is a, a, a typical situation, and, and uh, Einstein de Haas is another example. I have uh, once collected a lot of other examples, but I hope you believe me that there are situations where spin uh, can, be uh, can be described by a macroscopic spin density. So if you want to make correspondence of the P and the J to uh, momenta and the angle momenta, then you have to put H bar and also you have to do it properly with I. So here is just a generator of yes, a group. I took the real uh, representation in quantum theory, usually you take the image. So if you take that and, uh, uh, and then you, you will have a proper units. But, uh, but now, because it's all coordinates, nothing has units, so nothing has units for the cosmic operator too. Thank you for your help. I, I sh should point out that uh, Professor Lee has written a big article about spin in gravity, and uh, so some of these arguments which I have, uh, you find in his, in his article, which is fairly recent, two, two years ago? Uh, three, three years ago. Well, I could check it. It is printed in our book, you know, and so <laughs> I can check it. Really right. So I mean, uh, uh, I should add, add that way though. I mean, uh, which people uh, who are younger didn't know. Your originally this uh, Taiwan Institute for uh, Measure and Standard was here in Sinchu, not in the industrial park, but here nearby. And he had an experiment where he had a spin, a real spin, a quantum theoretical spin. He had a, a, a carefully selected alloy, a nickel uh, iron or something like that. Or what was it? Uh, it is disposing okay. iron. And he, 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 he weighted it and then he uh, 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 flipped the spin and weighted it again. and. Well, one couldn't see an effect, you know, but I mean, this is the type of thing one has to do. I mean, nowadays, one can probably do it more accurately, and, and some day people will repeat it. If you read this article, you can get many ideas in this direction. So, uh, and this was also one of the discussion points I had with Leto uh, quite some time ago. So, this Einstein de Haas effect, and I think you also mentioned that in uh, Helium 3, it's also mentioned in your article. There is this book of, of uh, uh, Wölfle and uh, Vollhardt and Wölfle, where this is described. This is uh, uh, sort of because of this uh, book in, in, in Helium 3, Vollhardt and Wölfle, uh, where, where this, uh, um, all the things you could do with Helium 3 are uh, described. Okay, I think I have now. Time is running. Yes. The other thing is, uh, is C1 always positive definite? Sorry? Is C1 always uh, positive definite? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, section three. Now I want to, this is now the particle aspect that we saw that the quantum theory comes in a, in a certain way. If I now in section 1.3, I want to, uh, to talk about the uh, matter fields, the field effects. Matter field, for instance, the photon field, Dirac field, what have you, Hoka field, Arita Schwinger field, Now, 
I think this stuff is fairly well known, but I think in order to uh, give a good idea how this age theory is in later on, I should report about this. Um, you consider a set of matter fields Pi, I runs from one to whatever number of field, fields you have, capital I, I of X, and then you have an action integral, I is equal to um, the volume integral over the Lagrange intensity, P for X times the Lagrange intensity, and the Lagrange intensity depends on this Pi and the first derivatives of the Pi. And of course, of the vector that put in there. And now you vary the coordinates and the field. So if you vary the coordinates, you substitute xi by x dash i equals xi plus um, delta xi. <coughs> 